Okay, turn to somebody and say, you look so much better when the lights come up. Would you do that? And then you can be seated. Good stuff. What a great night. So much excitement ahead. We're going to be dealing with that, some of that later. And uh, we're just believing God for an incredible uh, next week and a half. Actually, I'm saying it starts now. And man, we hit the ground. We're running now. And a week and a half from now, boy, I'm telling you. Well, one week from tonight, it's over. So make sure you're here next week, next Wednesday night. Though we're not having a formal like this type of deal, it's going to be this type of deal on steroids. So you need to be here. We go to the mountain, Jurgen Metesias. Don't you love Jurgen? Jurgen Metesias is going to be here. He's going to be bringing it. And then we go up to the mountain. It's just Sean Foyt that night. It's just going to be a, a special, special night you don't want to miss. Don't miss any of the conferences, Pastor said. I'm not going to preach that again, but it is life changing. This year is really going to be very, very special. Well, we're, as Pastor said, we are at. Uh, the final installment of Nothing But The Truth. And tonight, communicating the truth we're talking about. And, and I just want to start off by saying something that I think is really noteworthy for all of us. And that is this. How many realize that football is now America's pastime and not baseball? Only about five of us. That's right. Article came out. They took a survey. Football is now the preferred sport in America for people to watch than beloved baseball. Isn't that amazing? And what a perfect, perfect time that is to have God's team, the Kansas City Chiefs, start a dynasty, have a dynasty happen, but that's beside the point. You know, when, when a football player, let me use this football analogy, when a football player for the Kansas City Chiefs, a guy named Harrison Butker, when he kicks a field goal, you know, in order for that field goal to be good, and if you make a field goal, it's three points for your team. And if that field goal is going to be good, it has to go through the uprights, right? And the uprights are two posts. There they are. The two posts that stick straight up in the air. And the ball has to go between the two posts. If it goes to the left, if it goes to the right, if it hits it and bounces back, then it, the referee will come out and deem it no good because it didn't go between the uprights. There's a recognition here that these two posts are the determining factor of whether you have scored or not. Now, in a spiritual sense... Let's move over, even though football is very spiritual. In a spiritual sense, let's say this. God has two posts as well. And when it comes to your maturity, and when it comes to my maturity, and how the church should function, and when it comes to our communication, God has two posts. And those posts are shown to us in Ephesians chapter 4. He says this in, chap, in, in verse 14. And we're, if you have a Bible or you have your app, make sure to put it there because we're going to be dealing with this passage through the entire evening. But here it is, verse 14. As a result, Paul says, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, but by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Speaking the truth in love, we are now, we, we are to grow up in all aspects under him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. He says that if we are going to be built up, if we're going to grow up, he says, if we're going to make it to maturity as Christians, then we have to speak the truth in love, okay? Two posts responsible for your maturity, the, your influence in the lives of other believers is, and I want you to get this, circle it in that script, do everything you can, but to communicate, to speak the truth in love. The two posts our truth and love that are supposed to surround all communication that we have as Christians. Now, truth refers to the content of what we speak, right? 
Truth is the content and that, 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 that comes from our mouth. Love refers to the motivation, the way that, we, that we're supposed to do it. Truth, truth is the what and, and love is the how. We're to speak the truth with an attitude of love. Those two posts, now, they're standing side by side and they determine whether we have truly scored in our spiritual growth and in our influence, okay? I want you to get that strong in your mind. That's why I've hit it so hard as we move forward, okay? Paul, his concern here, as you can see, is the maturity of believers. He wants us to do what he says, to grow up. I don't know why it is that I always get these sermons that talk about growing up when I didn't even actually do it. So anyway, in my life, but I'll work on, let's move on. That's, I'll, I'll work that out in therapy. But anyway, but Paul says what he, he wants us to grow up because the reality is that many Christians 2,000 years ago didn't really grow up and mature spiritually. And isn't it interesting? We see that same thing in 21st century America or in the world today. Many Christians never grow up. They stay immature. They stay carnal. They stay secular. They never grow up because he says they're blown about by every wind of doctrine. The wind blows. It sounds good. It just moves them around. They never want to get deep enough. They never want to get in enough to really take root, you know? And so they'll just get blown around. I just want enough of God that I'm okay, okay? And and that that I feel good and I look good, all right? But it never really grow up. I mean, think about it. When you go to the doctor and, and the doctor tells you to stick out your tongue. You know, they used to do that and they got that stick. Stick out your tongue. You know, you don't, they don't have you stick out your tongue because they've never seen what a tongue looks like. And they want to see your tongue, okay? They ask you to stick out the tongue. Why? Because they're looking for something deeper. See, they're trying to see if there's a certain illness or some deficiency in your life. So they ask you to stick out your tongue. Now, the Bible tells us that a person's speech demonstrates their spiritual maturity or immaturity. It's them sticking out their tongue. Your speech is like sticking out your tongue. See, James chapter one, verse 26, he puts it this way. He says, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. In other words, he says, if you can't control your tongue, he says, it's because you are not mature yet. You don't know what to say, when to say it, how it should be said, either because you're not telling the truth or you're not telling the truth the right way. And it speaks to your spiritual immaturity. He says that we are not to be engaged with one another because he says this, this happens. We are to be engaged with one another. He says, because this happens by that, which every joint supplies. That's every Christian. I want you to catch this is to be ministering to others in truth in the attitude of love. So it's not just about hearing the truth that's important for us as believers. It's not just about hearing the truth. Oh, I just can't wait to hear the sermon. I just can't wait to hear this. I just can't wait to hear that. Listen, it's about ministering the truth that will determine whether you're gonna grow or not. You can sit in a church as long as you want and hear it fed to you and fed to you and fed to you. And all that's gonna happen is you're gonna become a fat person sitting there until you start giving it out. And that's when you're gonna see the big changes happening in your life. That's when you're going to see breakthroughs in your life like you've never seen before, okay? So that is so important for us to understand that we are to minister the truth in an attitude of love. See, that's why you can't be a holy roller, right? You know what a holy roller is? That's where on Sunday morning, you know, the alarm goes off and you hit the snooze button and you roll back over and go back to sleep. That's the way it works. You're a holy roller. Don't do that. See, I have heard so many excuses from people not being in the house of God ever since COVID. COVID was, it was the devil's tool to keep people out of the house of God. People you still use it. Oh yeah, I just love getting up in my pajamas and sitting in front of the, uh, the, the computer and just with my cup of coffee, watching, you know, watching pastor speak to me. I'm like, are you serious? 
I, I, I couldn't even imagine. That's a, that, that, my mind doesn't even want to go there. I don't want to see you in your pajamas in front of the computer. So don't even tell me that if that's the truth. You know, I can just watch it online. It's like self-service Christianity. How many remember fi- full-service stations, gas stations, when you were growing up? Okay, they used to have a thing, for those of you that are under 50, they used to have a thing called... Uh, full service gas stations. When you went to the gas station, it was automatic. You went in and boy, they were going to put uh, fluid on your on your windshield and they were going to wipe it off. You know, you didn't have to go to the to the you know to the street corner to have somebody wipe off your windshield. You could go into the gas station and they would hit you. <laughs> Sorry, a few of you got that. God bless you. You're slow, but you're worth waiting for. But anyway, so so. They, they would wipe off your, they would open up your hood and they would look in there and check your oil and check all the fluids. They would do that every time you went and filled up again. They would pump your gas, full service. Now everything's self-service. Now you're looking at me, some of you guys, and you're saying, what are you talking about? I have full service when I go to quick trip. I just turn to my wife and say, pump the gas. And that's full service. That's a problem. That's a problem. You need to see Pastor Franklin and Lisa, if that is in fact the truth. But it's all self-service these days, isn't it? And, and, and unfortunately, we are living, it kind of bleeds over into every area of life, and we're living in a day of self-service Christianity. If you look, we tend to worship selfish, not worship service. Huh? Because we don't understand that the church is not just here so that we can be blessed. The church is here so that we can be a blessing. And the goal of it, the goal of my speaking to you and you're speaking to one another in truth is to speak truth with love. Because that's the only environment, that's the soil that God is going to grow us in. Let me say a word about growing up. Speaking the truth, which it happens when you speak the truth in love. He just says it. Maturing in the Bible means to become an adult Christian. Where God's point of view is normal in your life. It's normal in your decision making. Every decision you make runs through the what would God think about this test. Every single thing we do, we, 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 and we don't do it perfectly. I, I think we're all honest. honest if we're honest, we're, we're, we, we work through this. We don't do it perfectly, but we should be doing it more and more and more. It should be increasing in our life if we're maturing. It's, it's kind of like a, 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 a spiritual thermometer to know whether you are growing or not. If you are making your decisions based upon what God would want you to do. Everything funnels through that. And that's the norm for your life. The more that becomes the norm, the more you know, man, something's happening. I'm growing in the grace of God. Think about this. When, children, when your children are growing up, if they're maturing, they're gonna make better decisions when they mature, right? It's just, it's just the way it is. They're able to choose better. It's like with medicine, you know? You get medicine, and where do you put it if you have little children? You have to put it way up in the cabinet to get it, right? And it says, keep out of the reach of children because kids can't discern what they should take and what they should not take or how much they ought to take. I mean, in my cabinet that I have, in my medicine cabinet, I have my medicine way up there and I have to get my son to come and get it down for me. But that's another issue altogether. So I'll talk about that later. Again, therapy. See, let me just tell you this. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor. You could, you could, he's looking at me like, where is this guy going? But anyway, think about this with kids. You could take a shiny marble and you could take a diamond and you could put them on a table in front of a child. And what's that child gonna do? In many cases, that child is gonna go after that marble, okay, and not the diamond. Why do they do that? Because they don't understand the value of the diamond. See, but the problem is when adults gravitate to the shiny marble, 
because they don't understand the value of the diamond. See, far too many Christians, we don't understand the value of the spiritual. So what do we do? We gravitate to the shiny because and it's the secular shiny because they see it's been polished up by the world and it's been made to look more appealing. But it doesn't have the value of spiritual truth and spiritual decision making for your life. Oh, it's shiny and it's pretty, but it can't do much. So spiritual maturity, it has to do with the decision-making and what God is after. That thing that defines the church, it's that maturing. That's what should define us. And one of the ways this happens, he says, Paul said, one of the ways this happens is to speak the truth, speaking the truth in love. That's the way we communicate. Speak the truth in love. And he says this in verse 16. From whom the whole body being fitted together from that which every joint supplies. Talking about individuals here. Colossians 1.28 says we are to present every member mature. Look at that. So that means no member is to get away with not growing in the body of Christ. Listen, let me me just get down to some practical things. Listen, we... You don't come to church for the preacher. Okay, now, (laughs) pastor says amen. Now, I will tell you, thank God, and I say this sincerely, thank God we have a man of God that doesn't compromise the truth at all. And he does it the right way. He speaks the truth in love. I'm telling you, this guy is on fire. If you're not coming on Sunday mornings, you're blowing it, man. There's an anointing that's in this place and on this man. But, But it's not for us to come to church just to hear a preacher. Some people, they want to come for the music, and we're not to come to church just for the music. Those are important things, the preaching and the music. It's very important. But you join a church so that you can grow. That's where you grow in your ability to make spiritual decisions on a consistent basis. And if that's not happening, guess what? You're not growing. No matter how much you like the sermon, no matter how much you applaud the singers, because it hasn't changed our decision-making, maturity has not changed occurred. Decision-making has to change before we can actually grow. 21-year-olds making five-year-old decisions is what churches around America are full of. They have the age, but they don't have the maturity because their ability to make decisions isn't based on the right criteria. It's missing. It's messed up. So we're to speak the truth. We're sp- are you still with me here? You're hanging with me. Okay. If somebody's drifting off, just punch them, okay? In love, punch them in love. That's what we're talking about tonight. So we are to speak. Maria gave me a look there. You know, she's ready to punch pastor on that one. So I got to watch this up here. So we are able to speak the truth. What is the truth? What is the truth? By definition, it's going to be on the screen. You can take a picture of it. An absolute standard by which reality is measured. An absolute, I'll put this word in there too, objective standard by which reality is measured. It's not subjective, it's objective. Let's put it more commonly. God's view on any subject, that's the truth. Because God is objective truth, right? And so as a result, it's his idea. It's his view on any subject. So this brings us to the matter. Anytime you're talking about communication, you gotta talk about the tongue, right? Because that's how we speak. We speak the truth with love because God uses our tongue as a measuring stick, as a dipstick, so to speak, okay, of how you are growing in your life. Look at what James 3 says about this. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect, saying that is a mature, okay? Perfect means mature. He is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body as well as his tongue. In other words, if you want to see how the rest of you is doing, look at how your mouth is doing. Because he says your mouth is the gauge of how messed up or how grown up the rest of you just happens to be. I mean, let's, let's get to brass tacks on this. If you're still cussing now as much as you did a year ago, Pastor Lane, let, let, let's move on beyond this. <laughs> Where is he? Oh, sorry, Pastor. <laughs> Break the tension. But it's real. If not with Dale, it's real with us. 
Not with Dale. If you're still cussing as much as you did a year ago, guess what? If you're still as profane as you used to be three years ago, okay, that means that not only have you not grown up in your speech, but there are other parts of your body that are messed up too. Because he says the tongue is the indicator of what the rest of you looks like. It's the truth. So people have not learned to manage their speech. They have other management and issues in their lives. It's the truth. And it's all showing up. It's being manifested in their speech. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 4, he calls it filthy, foolish talk. He says joking that seeks to hurt people in Ephesians chapter 5. He, he said it would bring in the profane, the profanity even. And, and all types of speech that is inconsistent with the character of God. So he says that's an indicator, not just that you can't speak, not just that you're stupid, <laughs> sorry, but you know, you can't think of other words. No, it shows that there's something much deeper going on in your life. That's messed up. It kind of reminds me of a little girl who was a pastor's kid and, and she was saying the word darn all the time, okay? Forgive me. But uh, my dad, in fact, I said darn one time in my house. My dad was a pastor. I remember doing this. I used the word darn and my dad heard me and he about took my head off. Can you imagine? Okay, it, it, so, but this was a pastor, same way cut out the same cloth he wanted to get his daughter to quit saying the word darn so he says okay he says i will give you 10 cents if you will stop saying the word darn and she says oh dad i know i know a lot of words that are over a dollar so why don't we go there huh you know <laughs> you know we live in a world of rancid speech don't we i tell you i went to the the open the other day, uh, on the day when they let everybody in, that was a nightmare. And I hadn't been to the Phoenix Open in a long, long time. And that day was about ridiculous. And I couldn't, I couldn't see anybody play. I didn't see anything happen. A couple guys swing a golf club. But all I could see was the person's back in front of me the whole day. We were just running through this place. And, people, and I had my grandchildren with me. I know, not a good move. And my son-in-law was with me too, and he's like one of my grandchildren. And, uh, but let me tell you, as we went through that place, I heard words I didn't ever know were invented yet. It was unbelievable. It was rancid what was going on out there. And that's just the community out there. We live in a world, that's the world. We live in a world of rancid speech. We live in a world of hateful communication, don't we? Where people, they, they, they get online and you see in social media and they're talking about people all the time and, 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 and it's just terrible, the things that they say. And then that kind of bleeds over, if we're not careful, into the Christian community. And we find ourselves getting caught up into it if we're not careful. And if we are there, it only shows a lack of maturity, explains our lack of impact that we're having. Look at what he says, Paul, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only, only such a word as is good for edification. That means to build up, he says, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Look at this. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. How do you make the Holy Spirit sad? Well, he tells us in verse 29. Up there, look at it. By unwholesome words. We're talking about words designed to hurt and destroy, not heal and to help. And so what does he say to counteract that? Speak the truth in love. And, and, and by love, he's saying, speak our truth. He's saying, speak with the correction and direction into the lives of people. And then I love this. Proverbs 10, 11 says this. The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. That's what I want people to say about me. But that guy, when he speaks, he just brings life. Because you know what? Words carry weight, don't they? They do. Words carry weight. I mean, if you go to work tomorrow and they say fired, that carries weight. You get it. If you go to a courtroom and they say guilty or innocent, that carries weight. So the Bible is clear. We, communication's necessary, but we have to speak the truth. Speak the truth. Speak the truth as a believer. 
We're people of the truth. You are to speak the truth. God's perspective on a matter. You're to speak it. We've got to speak the truth. Is that clear? We've got to speak the truth. And first, we've got to speak the truth to the world. That's why I love Freedom Night in America, because that's what we're doing. We're talking about, we're talking about Bible values and, and, and what the Bible has to say about what's happening in the culture today. We're speaking truth to the world. You know, the, the, the world needs to be hearing God's point of view from us. It doesn't mean you go to Home Depot and you set up a, 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 a place and, 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 you know, you just start preaching in Home Depot. I mean, if God calls you to do that, do it. But the point is, it, it, what, what, it, what it's telling us to do is we should be giving God's perspective, our perspective, as, and, and God's perspective from his point of view, not a world-centered point of view. We We should never agree with the world when the world is disagreeing with God. What is that? Think about it. And we're not to let sympathy cancel the truth for us. See, what what so many people I see do, they they have good intentions, but they get shamed into agreeing with lies because they say they're gonna call me names. They'll call you names. You know, they'll call you names. They'll say that's hate speech that you're spewing, you know? Not because you're being a hater, but because they don't like the truth. And so what we do in that is we get shamed. We back away from the truth. We want to keep our friends. We want to stay popular. You know, we don't want to be rejected, right? And so we just, say, let me say this. You should never back away from the truth for acceptance. Romans chapter three and verse four. Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. We are people of the truth. You are to speak the truth. God's perspective on every matter, you're to speak it. Amen. That's a good place to put your hands together. And we just don't, we don't just speak the truth to the world. We speak the truth to other Christians, right? Right? They should be hearing from us. We need each other in this. Truth doesn't just come from the pulpit. It comes from believer to believer, saint to saint. That's what you do. We encourage one another, see? That's why we got all these one another's, you know, in scripture where it says build up one another, care for one another, connect with one another, share with one another, welcome one another, greet one another. You got all these one another's in the word because growth happens in horizontal relationships, not just a vertical relationship. It's the way God set it up. So God wants you to be a part of a church like this, a family, a community, so that you can be spoken to and so that you can speak. You know what we call that? Iron sharpening iron. That's what that's all about. But you do it with the truth. That's the standard that we communicate. The mouth's a powerful thing when it comes to truth. But it's also a tool of transformation, a tool of healing, a tool of help. I mean, we're not helping our children much if we don't deal with them in truth, do we? And we're not helping God's children much if we're not dealing with each other in truth. You know, if a person needs corrected, there's a lot of people that are really quick to say, that's me, I'll I'll make sure to correct them. No, that's not where this is. If that's you, keep your mouth shut, please, especially around me, because we're doing the truth in love here, right? Let love precede your correction. And, and, And you got all these people, if a person needs correction, they need to hear the truth. But not only to speak the truth, we are to speak the truth in love. Truth has to be balanced with love. One of the great attributes of God, right? God is love. So what's love mean? Take a picture of it. In this context, it means this. The decision to compassionately, righteously, and responsibly seek the well-being of another. And the key to that is love is the decision. You make a decision that you're going to do this. You make a decision that you're going to love somebody in that way. Speak the truth in a way that the person that you're speaking to knows that you are doing it because you love them and because you're trying to help them and make them better. It's in their best. Speak the truth in love. Now that all being said, and somebody can come help me, thank you. That, tr- that all being said, here's something that we all need to know because anytime you talk about love and how we speak, people really take that a long way. But you gotta know this. Here it is. Love 
does not tolerate all views. Let me say that again. Love does not tolerate all views. It doesn't have to. In fact, that's why people are going to call us names from time to time. They're going to say you're intolerant. They're going to say you're a hater. Listen, we love all people, but we do not love all ideas. Let me say it again. We love all people, but we do not love all ideas. God makes a difference between the sin and a sinner, doesn't he? He does. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And he doesn't bring the two together. He doesn't join them as, you know, because I love the sinner, then I have to love the sin too. No, he doesn't do that. Loving a child doesn't mean accepting their behavior. You can, you, you can divide in your mind the personhood of your child and their actions, of course. And we're not to be immoral people. You know, but we are to love immoral people, just not their immorality. See, we are to love the racist, but hate racism. That's the way we are. We are to speak the truth in such a way that people know that we care about their well-being. And there's perks to doing this. God says, if you do this, I've got something for you. And I'll, I'll close with this. He says this. Let me show you a couple of these perks. First John chapter four. Are you still with me here so far? Okay, all right. Just want to just check. Beloved, let us, verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God for God is love. Verse 12. No one has seen God in any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love of God, which he has for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. So here it is. When you deal with the truth in the right way in love, because God is love, you see that all through there, he reveals more of himself to you when you deal with truth in the right way, in love. You know, he's talking here to Christians. He says they know God. And he says, you're going to have a greater experience in God. You're going to know God deeper if you do what I'm asking. He's not talking about just knowing information about God. No, this is talking about experiencing more of God's love. So if you need more of God's love in your life, guess what? You better show some more love to God's people. That's the way it is. It's the truth. So the first perk. Benefit that you get, God says, you will get more of me operating for you. He's going to let some of himself flow more freely if you operate in the truth with love, okay? But that's not the only perk. One more. He says, 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, little children. So he's talking to Christians. He says, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth so that we will know by this that we are of the truth and we will assure our hearts before him. See, he's bringing this truth and love together again, okay? And whatever our hearts condemn us for, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Beloved, if our hearts does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Now watch this. And whatever we ask, we... I'll do this again. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing to him. Guess what he says, perk number two. He says, if you're speaking the truth in love, more of your prayers are gonna get answered. I didn't say that. It's just right there. More of your prayers are gonna get answered. If you're communicating the truth in love, if you're reflecting him, he is more attuned to your prayers. He is love and he is truth. So when you, can, when you communicate truth in love, you've got the attributes of God that, that who he is. You are in God's grill in that moment. And so God now has, you've got his full attention. And he's saying in that moment, I'm listening to you. Whatever you pray, I'm going to answer for your life. Is that amazing? That's a pretty awesome thing. And one of the best ways to get your prayers answered. Speak the truth in love. You can't be a silent Christian. That's what he's saying. It's not a stay-at-home saint. That's not what we're talking about. He's, He's talking about, and I'm not just saying come to the sanctuary. Listen, I'm talking about 
getting involved in the life of ministry where you are touching people and people are touching you. You're serving people. People are serving you. You're connected. And you know these people that you're serving with so well that when truth is needed to be spoken, you're right there. And you love them already, so it's easy just to speak the truth in love. And they know you, and so it's easy for them to look at you and say, hey, man, I saw something here. You know, one thing I love about Pastor Luke, years ago he came up, and I've got to close. Years ago he came up and he said, Brad, he, he pulled a bunch of guys together. And he said, you guys, he said, I'm giving all of you permission, please do this. He gave us an invitation. He said, if you see a blind side in me that I'm not seeing, if you see something that just isn't right, that just doesn't look right, that I'm missing, please speak up. I give you permission, please, even if it offends, please say something to my life. That's what we're talking about. Being willing to receive truth, being willing to give truth. What happens when that takes place? You grow. You grow. You become more like Jesus. You start looking more like Jesus. And love is perfected in you. And God and maturity is perfected in your life. Look at James chapter 2, verse 13. He says, where you showed mercy, I will show mercy to you. That's a neat thing. Because I know there's a lot of people here right now and say, Brad, I just wish I'd heard this a long time ago. Because, man, I've said a lot of things. And I have a scorched earth behind me. So, I mean, I've got, I got people now that aren't my friends anymore. I've got family members that won't talk to me. So, man, I'll just tell you, I don't know. This genie is out of the bottle. I don't know that I can do this. I, I, it may be too, too late for this. Did you see what he said? He said, where you showed mercy, I show you mercy. If you make a decision today and you say, you know what? (laughs) I'm going to change where I'm going. I'm going to change the path that I'm on. I haven't gone too far. He's saying you can bounce back now and you make the decision in your mind that I can get this back. I can turn it around. I can start speaking truth and love. I can start showing mercy. What, What does God say he's going to do? He will now turn and show you mercy. And bring you to the place where you need to be. And you're going to be blessed. That's how it works. And that's what God has for us today. I want you to stand to your feet as we close here tonight. And we're going to close a little different. I'm going to ask Pastor, why don't you come up and just hang with me here for a minute. Because I'm going to have Pastor close us out at the very end. But before we do, I want to pray for everyone here. That you would say, Brad, this was a word for me today. This was a word for me today. In whatever area, maybe some of you have scorched earth behind you. Maybe some of you, you have relationships that have just been destroyed because you've been so good about telling the truth, but you haven't had any love. And you've just destroyed relationships everywhere. God wants to change that. It's held you back. Some of you, maybe it's your tongue. It's not what it needs to be. You're one of these people that hasn't grown because you just don't say the things you should be saying. You know? Maybe you're saying things. Maybe you're like the guys out there at the Phoenix Open. And you just, you, it's just well, it's just, I'm just with the guys around me, okay? No. God says, I want to grow you, and it's got to start somewhere. So start here, and let's get everything put together. Maybe if some of you would say, you know what? I've had trouble speaking up. I'm one of these guys that's been shamed into the corner. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to give me the boldness to speak the truth in love. If any of those things applies to you tonight, I want to see your hand in this room. Come on, lift your hand. Tell the truth, shame the devil. Take down the stanchions. I want you to be the first down here. We're going to get everybody down here before it's over because we're going to have a big uh, prayer time with everybody. But come on down. Those of you that lifted your hand, come on because I want to pray for you before we close. Go ahead and play, Adam, as they come down, would you?